I want to thank, you for, thank Jay for asking me to uh, preach this morning. I don't know if it was just because he had a birthday and he's getting old and he's getting tired, but uh, for some reason he asked, so uh, glad to help. The only thing I ask of Jay is if I start to get way off track, just say, squirrel, I'll jump back in because I want to try and finish in time enough to beat people to lunch, so, which would be good. But thank Jay for allowing this. Welcome you to uh, Hope Church this morning. Uh, my name's DJ. I'm part of the leadership team here. If you're a first-time visitor, I want to say welcome. I do believe we have some here this morning. One of the main things for you to know about Hope Church is that Jesus Christ is the very center of everything that we do. And if you're a partner with us or a regular attender, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for the work that you do, the service that you give to this church and to the Lord. Uh, there's still many places in ministry here where we need you engaged, uh, where we need your spiritual gifts to shine, and I know that God's going to give us uh, you know, the people that we need to do that. Uh, still many things to get in place, but it's all for Him. Jesus is a wonderful Savior. You know, our, fo our folks here, they work hard to make sure that your kids are cared for and looked after when they're here. They want to make sure that you feel welcome when you're here. I want you to have a meaningful worship experience. And I'm just thankful for the group that's up here every Sunday morning, for the group that's over here on Sunday morning, the group that's in the back on Sunday morning. Um, the work that goes in uh, is just amazing. I'm thankful to uh, just have a small part of that. Our hope is that this service is meaningful to you. Our current series deals with matters of the heart. I'm glad to say that I had my yearly physical this past week, and it went well. He said that my heart was in good shape. But my doctor has been trying for several years to get me on two cholesterol meds. And even last time I went, he prescribed them. I picked them up. I didn't take a single one of them. Uh, I just know how they make me feel. And so I really wanted to try and control this on my own. It's hard when it's hereditary. But I was convinced I could do some of that. This was the first visit that I've had where he said, hey, whatever you're doing's working. Your numbers are actually improving. Keep up the good work. And I just praise the Lord, because it's hard to eat salad as much as I eat salad. That is, that is tough. But it hadn't always been that way. Uh, I know a few years back, I went to see a doctor, uh, and he was, you know how they have the medical portal? One doctor will send information over, and another doctor can look at it. And so I was going to see a new doctor. And he said, why does your chart, your, why does your, your information say, don't tell wife about chest pain? I was like, does it actually say that in there? He said, yes, there's a statement in here that says, don't tell wife about chest pain. I said, well, I'll explain that to you. So a few years before that, seeing a different doctor, you know, I used to work out a lot more than I do now. I used to do P90 and try and stay in shape, and I'd run a lot. And, you know, I think my chest muscles would just get sore, and, you know, I'd just hit myself like that, and, you know, think, well, that'll take care of it. Just pound my chest. And I would do that a lot. I'd do a ton of push-ups. You, you come out of the Army, that's one of those things you just kind of keep with you. And, and you, you know, my chest would hurt, and I would just pound my chest and keep going. Well, Jill got a little tired of that. She'd had some people in her family that had some real heart issues. I had some people in my family that had some real heart issues, and things were going on, and people were going to the hospital, and they were getting, uh, and bad things were going on. She said, I'm making you an appointment. I don't need an appointment. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm making you an appointment. Well, I'm thankful that there was nothing wrong. But what the doctor did was he put in my notes, don't tell wife about chest pain. And so that's where that came from. Nothing wrong with my heart. Uh, just did a little too much at that time. I can't do that stuff anymore. 
But this current series deals with the heart. We're not talking about the physical heart that pumps blood through our body. We're talking about that spiritual heart. And there's many aspects in Scripture that deal with the heart. In biblical teaching, the heart is looked at as the seat of emotion. It's looked at as part of our mind for thinking. It's our moral compass that guides our way. Our heart is the place where righteousness begins and grows. It's the place where sin begins and grows. And Jay shared some about that a few weeks ago. As believers, there are certain characteristics of life that we want to experience. We want joy that transcends any situation we find ourselves in. We want a peace that's unlike anything anybody around us can understand. We want our homes to be focused on the things of God, following hard after Him. We want to have personal revival. We want our hearts to be right with God. Last week, Jay was sharing about giving our heart, our all, to God, to our families, our spouses, and to our neighbors. But what messes that up? What keeps God from blessing us and bringing us revival? Spiritual, personal revival, and revival as a church and as a people of God. What messes that up? It's sin. What causes our marriages and our relationships to struggle and crumble? Sin. With that statement, many of us would agree, especially when we think about sin around us, sin in the world, or sin that's committed against us. But the place that we're going to go this morning, <coughs> excuse me, what about when it's your sin? What about when it's your fault? <coughs> what about when it's your heart that's not right with God? <coughs> I'm going to cough some. I'm getting warm up here. <coughs> we all have heart issues. Not of the physical kind, but of the spiritual kind. Your heart encompasses who you are. It's the very fiber of your being. At Hope Church, Jesus Christ is the center of everything we do. Jesus himself was concerned about how we perceive sin and how we react when we commit sin in our life. Because he loved you, he gave you a parable. What do you can think about, <coughs> excuse me, when you find yourself in sin? If you have your Bible open to Luke 18, I swear, I went through this twice this morning. I didn't get hot. Now I'm hot up here. So I apologize for that. <coughs> Jesus gave us a parable in Luke 18. And so Jesus told this parable. To those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. And they treated others with contempt. <coughs> Two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, Prayed like this, God, thank you that I'm not like other men, that I'm not an extortioner, unjust, an adulterer, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give tithes of all that I get. And that was how he prayed. But the tax collector, he stood far off. <coughs> Excuse me. And he couldn't lift up his eyes to heaven. Then he beat his breast like that. He said, God, 
Be merciful to me, a sinner. That was all he could pray. Jesus said, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. Everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh. There's healing for a broken heart. First off, you have to have one. I'm not talking about a heart. We all have that. You have to have a broken heart. And the first thing with that is your heart must be broken over your sin. Friends, we all sin. But we aren't all broken by that sin. The parable that Jesus told was not about one righteous man and one un unrighteous man. <coughs> it was about two sinners. <coughs> one who was broken by sin, and the other who didn't recognize it at all. Did not understand it. He was righteous in his own eyes. To be broken over our sin, we must recognize that we do sin. Not everyone acknowledges their sinfulness. Many people who claim to be Christians still justify themselves rather than humble themselves over sin. Many in the world today don't even recognize that there is such a thing as sin. I'll say one of the Anybody here ever worked with somebody who was just rather mean to work with? Hard to get along with? Sad thing is, one of the meanest people I ever worked with was someone who claimed to be a devout Christian. And they would let you know that. But no one could get along with that person. And it became my, my job one day to have to sit down and have that conversation. You have to treat people better. And the statement that I got back might not be one that you say, but I hope it's not one that you think. I don't sin. That's what I was told. I don't sin. Scripture says different. And John tells us, 1 John chapter 1, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. Many people do not grasp the horror, the darkness, the other utter filthiness which sin brings. Big sins, little sins, they all possess the power to destroy your heart, destroy your life. You may be here this morning not realize how awful a price had to be paid for your sin, for my sin. One of the main symbols we have in the church is a cross. There's many structures that are built throughout the Bible. Noah built an ark. Moses was told to build a tabernacle. David prepared and Solomon built a temple. Nehemiah built a wall. But what impacts us the most as Christians is that cross that was built. We have it on our t-shirts. We have it in paintings. Thanks to Jimmy, I've got one in my pocket. Thank you, Jimmy. We wear them around our neck. Have them on our bumper stickers. But what is the cross? Think about that. What is a cross? The cross was a simple Roman device 
for torture and death. That's what it was. We've got a very beautiful cross here behind us, and it's gorgeous. It's really beautiful, uh, the way that it's been built and put together. So let me ask you, this is a Roman device for torture and for death. As Christians, what do we know? Who was on the cross? I might say that again. Who was on the cross? I heard a few people. Let me try one more time. Who was on the cross? Jesus. I know y'all can be louder than that, but we'll move on because I don't want to get all squirrely and go off somewhere. Why was he there? Why was he there? Answer that question. Why was he there? My sin. Your sin. That's why he was on the cross. My selfishness. Your selfishness. My pride, your pride, my evil actions, evil desires, evil thoughts, and same for you. Jesus went to a Roman device of torture and death, not because he had sinned. He went for me to pay for my sin. He went for you. There might be someone here this morning that's never actually put that together. That Jesus went to the cross to pay for your sin. We all sin, even as Christians. Even though we've been given the way of escape, the power to overcome sin, we have not yet arrived. We still sin. The Bible tells us that. And Jesus shows us that we're to be broken over our sin. We're to get hot and cough even when we don't want to over sin. There is healing for a broken heart. But first, your heart must be broken when you sin. And that's something that affects every single person here. Second point, bring your broken heart like a sacrifice to God. Bring your broken heart like a sacrifice to God. When that tax collector came to the temple and he came before God, he had nothing to offer other than a broken, filthy, sinful heart. But he owned it. He brought it. Unfortunately, like the Pharisees, sometimes we just want to stare up into, into the sky and say, Oh Lord, you're lucky to have me. Tax collector knew better. When we're honest with ourselves, we know that we can only come as that man did. Your sin has to affect you that way. How many of you here have ever had the wind knocked out of you? If you ever played any type of sports, that's probably happened. If you played football, baseball, softball, basketball, volleyball, soccer, if there's a ball involved, you can fall on it and knock the wind out of yourself. You can take a hit right in the gut, and you can't breathe. It's actually, it's a spasm that takes place in your diaphragm that prevents your body from breathing normally for usually a temporary period of time, a few minutes. But for those few minutes, how do you feel? I've had it knocked out of me many times. I was a little guy. But I'd try to run the ball, and I'd get beat all to pieces. And I'd get the wind knocked out of me, and I'd lay there. And that panic hits because you can't breathe. And you, know, you want to play, you want to do those things, but at that moment, the only thing you want to do is breathe. But you can't breathe. And people are around you, they're going, hey, it's going to be okay, you just got the wind knocked out of you. Try to breathe. I'm like, I'm trying but you can't do it. 
How do you react when you sin? How do you physically, emotionally, mentally react when you commit sin? Is there a quick sense of horror at what you've done? Or is there some form of pride that creeps in? Do you have an immediate panic that runs through you because you know that God knows what you've done? Or do you ignore that? Do you find it hard to breathe, hard to function, because your sin has just knocked the wind out of your spirit. Friend, I'm going to tell you something. If you don't experience things like that, if your sin does not bother you, if you do not care about sinning against the God of heaven and against the people around you, it's very possible you do not know the God that Jay gets up here and preaches about, the God that the people that are sitting here have trusted their salvation in. You may not know the very God who sent His Son to die for you. Because if you did, then when you see it, you would understand the horror of that and what He went through for that. Taking a step back in the Old Testament, the Bible says about King David, he was a man after God's own heart. He was a hero for the nation of Israel. He was a good friend. He was a great king. He was a skilled musician. He was a writer of songs. He was also a massive sinner. A little suspect on being a good family man but he was equally a man of great repentance. There was so much to learn from that man. God opened up his life so we could see so much of it. There are many things in King David that we're to emulate, imitate, but God never approved of his sin. He doesn't approve of mine, and he doesn't approve of yours. You remember the words that the tax collector said? God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Very similar words were spoken by David. Psalm 51, verse 1, David says, Have mercy on me, O God. And then he goes through that psalm, beginning to ask God to do things for him that only God can do, he says, blot out my transgressions, wash me completely from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. He begs God to purge him, to wash him, to cleanse him. Why? Because David can't do it himself. Sin is not something you can just get rid of on your own. That's a job that takes God. That's a job that takes a Savior. He couldn't do it, neither can you. David had the law, he had the Ten Commandments, he had the Levitical sacrificial system. None of that really mattered when he found himself in sin. His heart was torn apart by grief. And the greatest sacrifice that David knew he could give was a broken heart. Just like the tax collector, his heart bothered him. His whole being was rattled because of his sin. Without getting right with God, David would never have another day on this earth with real joy. And he was begging God for that as well. Psalm 51 verse 10, David asked God, he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. David cried out for God to clean him, renew him. It's like a, a little baby that cries out to have its diaper cleaned. That baby cannot do it. It doesn't do any good to sit there and say, all right, little baby, change yourself. It can't. Just as David could not clean himself. Sin renders us helpless. You can't fix this one on your own. In verse 16 of Psalm 51, David says, talking to God, you will not delight in sacrifice, 
or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. David says, Oh God, you will not despise, and God will not. Contrite's not a word that we often use. It's not even in the Bible very often. It comes from the Hebrew word daka, which means to break, to collapse, to crush, to wound. And that was David's heart. That was the, the state that he was in. He had been crushed. His heart had been crushed by his sin. Because we all sin, we should all find ourselves at some point in life where we're like David was. When we think of bringing a sacrifice to God, we sometimes think of that Old Testament, bring a goat, bring a bull, it has to be perfect, no blemish. But in this case, as was the case with the tax collector, David could only bring his broken heart. Because that's all that he had. That's what had to be fixed. He brought the ugliest, dirtiest thing that he owned a contrite heart. There is healing for your broken heart. One, you have to be broken over your sin. Two, your broken heart, give your broken heart like a sacrifice to God. You have to give that to Him because only He can take care of that for you. Last, go down to your house justified. Basically saying, go home with a right heart. That's what Scripture said about that tax collector. That's what Jesus said. He went down to his house, justified. I'm not going to read all of uh, Isaiah 57. It's a beautiful portion of Scripture. I think I've read Isaiah at least 30 times. One of the greatest books that is in the Old Testament. If you've never read it, read it. There's a portion of Scripture in Isaiah 57. God starts out talking about the idolatry of the nations. But then He jumps to His people who are also backsliding, but have a heavy heart about that. And he uses that word contrite again. And God says in Isaiah 57, verse 15, Thus says the one who was high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity. Talking about how great God is. <coughs> how separated from us He is. Whose name is holy. Just a second. God says, I dwell in the high and holy place. And also with him who is of a contrite heart, who is, who is of a contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly, to revive the heart of the contrite. Think about that. God, who created everything, this earth, other planets, heaven itself, where he lives, says, hey, that's my home, but I have another place that I like to spend my time. And it's in the heart and in the life of the person who is broken. <clears throat> Friend, that might be you. You may have something that's heavy on you because of something that you did, something that you caused, something that was your fault. That's not a reason to run away from God. That's a reason, God says, to run to Him. That's where He wants you. What was the result of the tax collector humbling himself before God, bringing his sinful heart as a sacrifice? Jesus said He went down to His house justified. What was the result of David offering his broken, contrite heart to God? 
he found renewed joy of salvation, God gave him a new heart. Friend, he can do that for you. As Isaiah 57 says, what happens when God decides to inhabit the hearts of the broken? He revives them. He renews their spirit. He gives them new life. Friend, he can do that for you. I beg of you, keep short accounts with God over your sin. Don't let acts of sin drag on. Because they will continue to drag you down and drag you further away from the fellowship that you should have with your Father. I'm going to close with this. I've often been proud of my daughter. I don't know where she's sitting. She's way in the back, back there. This past week was great. It was Valentine's this past week. And her husband worked second shift. And she said, I don't want to be home alone on Valentine's. Can I come and make y'all dinner? Young people, that was great. Of course, she's a good cook. But that was so sweet that she wanted to do that. And there's one or two other times in her life where I've also been proud of her. And, <laughs> and, and I'll share one of them. She was four years old. And we were living out on Curve Road. And I was working at Food Line and going to school. So there were a lot of nights when I was getting home 11 o'clock or later. And being four years old, she's always in the bed. And so I get home, and around 11.30, I lay down in the bed, and I'm there wanting to fall asleep, and I feel that. If you're a parent, you've had that from time to time. And I look over and said, hey, Meredith, what you doing up? She said, I got to show you something. It's 11.30. She's supposed to be asleep, but she's been waiting on me to get home. I said, okay. So she takes me back to my room where I've got books and a computer. And this is back in the day when computers had a little tray that comes out. Well, she showed it to me, and <clears throat> the tray had a big crack in it. It was broken. And all she really could say was, am I in trouble? Am I going to get a spanking? And what do you think I did? Because I didn't mind spankings. I mean, I think they're important sometimes. That's how I feel about spankings. This was a child who waited until I got home, stayed awake, and wanted to show me what had happened. All I could do was melt and give her a hug, tell her I loved her, send her to bed. And when she went to her room, everything between me and her was right. And she knew that. Friend, you have a Heavenly Father who wants the same thing from you. That you come to Him when you've hurt Him when you've sinned against him, and you be honest with him and you tell him, he'll forgive you. He'll give you a new heart. He'll make your heart right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you, O oh God, that you sent your Son to die for us, to pay for our sins, to give us new life. And Lord, even with that, we're not perfect. We do mess up. We do sin. But God, you give us such an avenue to just come and ask you to make things right in our life. And I pray that if there's anyone here who's struggling with that, there's a sin that's holding them back, that God, you deal with them. Let them know they can go home today with a heart that's right with you. We thank you, Lord, for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.